What does a syringe have to do with a bullet? Some people say if you come at them with a syringe, they're going to give you a bullet. No, it's not the connection we're after today. It's 1996. I'm in San Antonio, Texas at Lackland Air Force Base. I'm in Air Force boot camp, and I'm in line to receive my vaccinations. The flu, typhoid, yellow fever, all sorts of weird stuff that the government, in their infinite wisdom, wants to make sure I will not contract in case I'm deployed. And I'm in line with a bunch of other dudes who just had their heads shaved. And I'm being told to remove my battle dress uniform blouse and to roll up the sleeve on my left arm, on my t-shirt, and to relax my arm. And the rumor going through the line is, if you tense up your arm, your shoulder will explode. And it'll explode because they're not using a typical syringe to administer these vaccines. Instead, they've got this air-driven thing. And I can see in the line ahead of me that the nurse is going, psh, 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 and they're air injecting these vaccinations like this into the airman's arms, and I'm coming up fast. Fast forward 25 years. I'm at the Veterans Affairs Community-Based Outpatient Clinic in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm in line for a vaccine again. Well, this kind of time it's for COVID-19. And I'm feeling some trepidation and some nervousness once again, not because I'm worried that my shoulder's going to explode. It didn't. But because the vaccine is new and because I'm otherwise healthy and because I've read that there are potential side effects, heart conditions, other stuff I don't want, other things I don't want. But I'm there voluntarily. This is back around April, I believe. I went as soon as I was eligible. And I got it because I'm in my early 40s and I'm male. And the older you are and the more male you are, the harder this stuff hits you sometimes. And I wanted to return to some sense of normalcy. I don't have to worry about it quite as much. Stop spraying my groceries with a Clorox solution. And so I get the shot. Why am I talking about this? Well, because today we're discussing a Defense of Compulsory Vaccination by Dr. Jessica Flanagan. And this is an article she published back in 2013. And her target back then was primarily, I take it, parents who refused to vaccinate their children to go to school for things like typhoid and measles and uh, other diseases that have been largely eradicated. But due to concerns over autism, and allergies and for religious reservations or because of religious reservations some parents wanted to refuse to have their kids vaccinated and so Dr. Flanagan came out with this argument. Here's the core of her argument. Imagine that it's uh, mid-June and you get an email from me and I say hey I'd like to have you over to my place for the 4th of July for a backyard cookout. Let's celebrate American independence and style. And you come over and I'm up here on the porch and I'm grilling and you're out in the yard playing soccer with my kids and we hear a gun go off, which isn't especially surprising around here. I heard a gun go off 15 minutes ago. And I say, oh, that's just my neighbor, Daryl, up on the hill. He's just, I don't know what he's shooting, but don't worry about it. And a few seconds later, a bullet comes down and lands in your shoulder. And you start bleeding out, and we try to stop the bleeding. We have to rush you to the emergency room. And I call Daryl and say, Daryl, what is wrong with you? Why are you shooting my friends? And he says, oh, Matt, I'm so sorry. I was just celebrating the 4th of July. I was just firing a gun in the air. I had no idea it would come up down over there. What are the chances? Now imagine that it's a month later, and it's Labor Day, and you're healed up, and you decide to celebrate being healed up by inviting me to your place in the suburbs where people don't just fire guns in the air. And I'm there at the barbecue or at the, uh, the cookout, and I notice that someone's coughing. And so I keep my distance and I leave early. But then three days later, I come down with COVID-19 symptoms, and it turns out that this friend of yours was not vaccinated, and they gave COVID-19 to several different attendees, including me. I had a breakthrough case. Flanagan wants to argue that if you think that in the first case, it would be appropriate to hold my neighbor Daryl liable for his stray bullet that lodged in your shoulder. If you think it would be appropriate to say, Daryl, you should not have done that. It would be appropriate to prohibit people from just firing guns randomly into the air. Then you should agree that it would be okay to force people to get vaccinated. However, however, when it comes to the, the forcing of the of vaccination, I meant to open with this and I forgot. She says specifically, 
It would be wrong for governments to kidnap, restrain, and forcibly inject vaccines into unwilling citizens. So she wants to say very clearly that, look, I'm not saying we should hold people down and inject stuff in their arm. I want to give them these, these incentives to get vaccinated, which I'll talk about in just a second. But I wanted to go ahead and clear away any worries that this is going to be an argument that people should be trapped and stuff injected in their bodies, although it might come to that. No, I wouldn't come to that. So that's the basic analogy. If you think it wouldn't be okay for him to shoot the gun in the air, it wouldn't be okay for you to go around unvaccinated because in both cases you're presenting risks to others that you ought not present to them. And here's a key quote. Vaccine refusal, I argue, or Flanagan argues, is morally similar to firing into the air and endangering innocent bystanders. In both cases, the shooters and the non-vaccinators may never see the harm they cause to others. Both shooters and non-vaccinators may feel justified in exposing people to small risks of getting shot or infected with a contagious illness for the sake of their own freedom to fire guns or refuse vaccination. Yet neither shooters nor vaccinators rights entitle them to harm others, despite the fact that the risk of harm is of low probability, their victims are unlikely to identify them, and they do not intend to injure the victims. Daryl didn't mean to shoot you with that bullet. Your friend at, at your party didn't mean to infect me. And if we hadn't traced the infection back to that person, I wouldn't have known. And if I didn't just know he likes to shoot guns, we wouldn't know it was him, known it was him. But in both cases, argues Flanagan, not okay. The risks that non-vaccinators pose to others, and again, she wasn't talking about COVID-19, she was talking about other stuff, but I think her argument still applies, or at least we can consider it anyway. Says that it's more likely that you will acquire and transmit the disease if you're not vaccinated. It's more likely that you're going to diminish herd immunity if you're not vaccinated, or I guess it's not more likely, it's, it is the case you'll diminish herd immunity. And you pose special risks to the immunosuppressed and newborns, people that are undergoing chemotherapy treatment, organ transplant recipients, and people with HIV. Now she says there's an analogy amplification. When uh, you don't get vaccinated and you spread a contagious disease, it's not just like you harm that particular person, you harm that person and anyone else that they infect and anyone else that those people infect. And so, in fact, so to make the analogy a little bit closer, a little bit tighter, we would have to say that when my neighbor Daryl fires his gun in the air, this inspires my neighbor Mike to fire his gun in the air. And his wife Misty comes out and she fires her gun in the air. And then Barbara, right next door, fires her gun in the air. And then Monroe Sneed up at the end of the road, he fires his gun in the air. And then Sue Tinker pulls out a shotgun over here and she fires her gun in the air. And this just causes a ripple effect and inspires people to celebrate Independence Day in that reckless fashion. That's not the case, but that would make it more akin to what happens when you're not vaccinated and you can spread a deadly disease. Finally, it also makes a connection with Typhoid Mary, a character from the first part of the 20th century who had typhoid and was a cook and refused to have her gallbladder removed, which apparently was something you could do to prevent the transmission of typhoid. And so she was, and, and she infected several dozen people, killing three. And so she was forcibly confined, quarantined against her will to prevent her from continuing to spread this. Here's a quote. Through their own willful ignorance, negligence, and resistance to public health authorities, both typhoid Mary and non-vaccinators deliberately endanger and potentially harm people by transmitting contagious diseases or contagious illnesses, essentially turning themselves into biological weapons. There's an explosive quote. And in this way, both typhoid Mary and non-vaccinators make themselves liable to coercive course of intervention because of the potentially harmful consequences of their behavior. Now Flanagan says that there are some necessary conditions that must be met for her argument to kick in. It's not just like any old vaccine can be forced on folks. She says that number one, the illness has to be contagious. There is a vaccine for tetanus. I remember getting my tetanus shot when I was a kid, but tetanus isn't spread from person to person. It's spread from rusty nail to foot. And so if you want to risk your own health by not getting the test, tetanus shot, that's up to you because you don't pose any risk to anybody else. So this argument wouldn't apply there. The second one, those who are exposed to the risk of transmission do not voluntarily put themselves at risk. She says that we can't use her argument to force people to get vaccinated for sexually transmitted diseases because the only people liable to catch sexually transmitted diseases are those who are engaged in sex. And you can avoid those diseases by being abstinent or monogamous or whatever. 
And so you can't use our argument to force vaccines for that. Also, vaccination is necessary and effective at limiting contagious transmission. It actually has to work and be something that's needed to prevent the transmission. And last, vaccination would not violate rights of self-defense. I'm not a fan of the language of rights, but all she's saying here is, and she makes a cool twist on, or, or puts a cool twist on her analogy, she says that if there were a bear charging my neighbor Daryl up here, I've heard rumors that bear come around here every once in a while. I've never seen one. I've been here many years. But say if there were a rabid bear charging Daryl and he were to back up and pull out his 357 and fire at the bear and accidentally miss and his bullet come down here and hit you in the shoulder, well, that would be a very unfortunate accident, but Daryl wouldn't be nearly as blameworthy or liable for that accident than he would be if he was just shooting in the air to celebrate because he was trying to defend himself. And our moral intuitions tell us that it's okay to put others at at least slight risk or some risk when we're defending ourselves. Similarly, if a person is immunocompromised already or they have a known allergy, or if you're a pregnant woman and you want to protect the welfare of the unborn developing human within you, then you can refuse the vaccine on those grounds, either as a matter of self-defense or out of defense of your unborn developing human. That's a qualification she puts on there, or four qualifications. Now, what about religious exemptions, a, a case that people often make? She says, no. No, she says, look, the shooter might claim that he had strong cultural or philosophical reasons for celebrating Independence Day with gunfire. Yet this wouldn't be reason enough. Similarly, prohibiting religious citizens from turning themselves and their children into biological weapons via compulsory vaccination is okay. Now, as I said earlier, she wants to use the least amount of coercion possible to get this across. And she offers some, some suggestions to do it, to encourage people rather than forcibly hold them down and give them shots. Number one, exclude non-vaccinators from public services. If you're not vaccinated, you don't get your income tax return. If you're not vaccinated, you can't visit public parks. There'd be some ideas. Number two, make some jobs contingent upon vaccination. She says healthcare workers, cooks, quote, people who interact with the public, like those in retail or commercial food service, given their relatively high potential to transmit illnesses. Notice that our own country recently made it obligatory for all federal employees to receive the COVID vaccination, regardless of what type of work that they do. A little bit different from our standard here. Maybe there's a reason for that, a justifying reason, but there's a difference to consider. Number three, enforce fines on people who are unvaccinated and then use that fine revenue to cover the costs of outbreaks. So if you don't want to be vaccinated, all right, you're going to have to send us a $100 fine check uh, once a month or once a year, and we're going to collect that money. And whenever out outbreaks occur, we're going to use those funds to pay for the ICU beds and the ventilators and whatnot. And then last, make the unvaccinated financially liable when they spread the disease and outbreaks can be traced back to them. She says, quote, non-vaccinators can be required to pay damages to whomever they harm by transmitting contagious illnesses and held liable for any harms their children suffer by remaining unvaccinated. And if public health officials can trace an outbreak to its source and that source is not, un is not vaccinated, then those harmed by the outbreak can sue either the unvaccinated adult or the parent of the unvaccinated child at the source of the outbreak. So this is making people liable for spreading the disease. So I've heard this analogy with drunk driving. If you drink and you drive, you may be okay with putting yourself at risk, but you're putting others at risk as well. It's not just that you might crash into a telephone pole. You might hit somebody else head on and kill them. And so if you do, you should be held liable for the harm that you cause them. Similarly, if you choose to go unvaccinated, okay, that puts you at risk. That's your personal decision, but that personal decision is also putting others at risk. And so if you do that, you take that risk and you catch it and you spread it, well, now you're gonna to need to pay for their medical bills, maybe additional bills for pain and suffering. It could get really expensive. And that would be one way to encourage people to get vaccinated without having to hold them down. Hugh LaFollett made a, uh, a similar argument in an old article called Gun Control. And he said one way to encourage people to be more careful with their firearms and to prevent them from falling into the hands of known criminals is to have a strict liability policy whereby if someone steals your firearm, regardless of whether or not you had it locked up in 10 safes or just lying around, if somebody steals it and commits a crime with it, you should be held liable for that. And if that were the case, then people would be much more careful with them. Similarly, if we were liable for disease transmission, 
then we'd be more careful about not spreading diseases, possibly think more about getting vaccinated. Now here are some thoughts about this. The primary empirical questions here seem to be how dangerous, the, what's on the scales here, would be how dangerous is the disease in question and how safe and effective is the vaccine? This was published back in 2013, and so this was way before COVID-19, and so anything we, any ways we use this to apply it to COVID-19, we need to think about those factors and all these different qualifications, and you might have to, you would ask, how deadly is COVID-19? Well, the percentage of people who actually die from it is somewhat low, very low, low percentages, very low percentages. However, last count that I've heard is 700,000 people in the U.S. alone have died of it. So it's so contagious, it may not be super deadly for most of the population, but it's so contagious, contagious and deadly enough that it's killed not, uh, not quite a million people, but we're going to get there, I'm afraid. On the other side of the equation, how safe is the vaccine? If you think it's super duper safe, you're just fooling yourself because it's only been around for a few months. We don't know the long-term impact. There are cases where people do have adverse reactions. A lady I work with told me just last week that she's having heart problems. And the doctors are telling her, we believe this is linked to the vaccine. They believe they can treat the heart problems, but she was otherwise super, super healthy. No problems whatsoever. And now, you know, something that's, that's uh, screwing up her ticker. That's not cool at all. Now, that's just an outlier case. And even by sharing that, maybe I'm being reckless because the uh, folks who promote vaccines and promote public health uh, want to suppress any of those examples. But if we're honest, we have to admit that there are side effects. We don't know the long-term uh, impacts. Uh, we just don't know yet. However, we can look at the studies. We can look at credible sources, if there are credible sources still out there. And uh, each of us has to make our own decision about how dangerous it is for us. If we're parents, how dangerous it is for our children. Uh, before our oldest son was vaccinated, I reviewed studies, or I guess studies about studies, where some kids had heart inflammation issues related to the vaccine. And so it's not like it's, it's an easy decision. It's not, but these are the sorts of things you would need to have in mind in making that decision. And I'll have to email Flanagan and send her this video and see what she thinks about her old argument applied to this new virus. Thank you, Flanagan, for a very cool argument.